Right now, it's all about making it easy. Making it easy for yourself in the kitchen means using the time you have effectively. And the one thing that can really help you do that is your freezer. My recipe for meatballs is so versatile, it can be used to make a dozen amazing dishes. One of my favorites is meatballs in fragrant coconut broth. Having a freezer of home-cooked delicious food ready to go can be a real lifesaver. It means you never have to compromise on flavor. These meatballs are delicious, but more importantly, they freeze so well. First off, get your pan on and start sweating off your onions and your garlic. This recipe involves making the meatballs in a classic way, but the exciting part is actually cook them in coconut milk. And it gives a really nice new dimension to a sort of soft, rich, sumptuous meatball. Chop the onion nice and finely, keeping those slices very close together. The closer the slices, the finer the onion. Pat it back down at an angle, slice down, and just chop. I want the onions nice and fine because I want some finesse to these meatballs. And the secret of a really good meatball is the texture, getting that balance right between the minced beef, the breadcrumbs, the milk, and the seasoning. A couple of cloves of garlic. Slice the garlic really nice and thinly. Nice. Pan, nice and hot, and a tablespoon of olive oil. Quite generous with the olive oil. Onions and garlic in. A little touch of salt and pepper. With your mince, open it up a little bit and sort of pat it out. Salt and pepper. For me, a good meatball is all about the, the softness, the texture of that rich beef, and the way it sort of melts in your mouth. You can color it on the outside, but you want it nice and soft and sort of rich in the center. Mix that in beautifully, and then paste it back out again. I've got some really nice dried chili flakes. I'm gonna season the onions with the chili flakes. Chili flakes in. Cook that out for two minutes. I'm gonna add some milk. Take your breadcrumbs, make a little well, three or four tablespoons of milk. That makes a sort of nice, slightly doughy texture, but it lightens the texture of the meatball. Place that in. Add your onions, your garlic, and your chili in there as well. Nice. Get your hands in there and start mixing them. If you've got the right amount of milk and breadcrumbs, it doesn't need binding with an egg. Don't make them too small. The problem with making them too small is the fact that they dry out quickly. Just the size of a golf ball. A little bit bigger. Nice. Give them a really nice tight squeeze. That stops it from breaking up. It always pays to double the recipe and spend a bit more time making extra meatballs so you can freeze a batch ready for another time. Give the pan a little wipe out. Don't wash out that pan. We've got that flavor from the onions and the garlic at the bottom. Get that pan nice and hot. A touch of olive oil in there. Place them on the top of your pan. Nice and gently sit them in the oil. Get a palette knife and go underneath them and just sort of tilt the pan and let the pan cook the back of the meatball. We're going to add some heat. Coriander seeds, slightly spicy and peppery. This will give a really nice flavor to the coconut milk. In. Next, some cardamom seeds. Three or four onto the board. Knife on. In. A little touch of turmeric into the center of the pan. That's going to give it a really nice spicy flavor. A little pinch of cinnamon. And all the time you're doing this, those meatballs are just getting tastier and tastier. A couple of dried chilies. Let them infuse in that oil. And then some lemongrass. Just take the back of your knife and sort of beat it down. That starts to release all that lovely sort of fragrance. It's like someone's just let off the most amazing fragrant air freshener in with the lemongrass. And finally, some fresh ginger. Just peel and slice nice and thinly. Time now to turn them over and let the other half for a wonderful flavor. Chicken stock, 
in. Bring the stock up to the boil, turn the gas up, and then add the coconut milk. And I want the coconut milk just sitting underneath the top of the meatball. Coconut milk in. And that sort of gives it that creamy richness, but it's not heavy. It's a fragrant, light richness. Before we start simmering, check the seasoning. Mm. That nice, soft texture of the meatball. But that fragrant, light richness of the coconut broth is going to cook those meatballs perfectly. Bring the broth up to the boil, then simmer gently for eight to ten minutes. Touch them with your finger. This should be slightly pliable, but slightly springy. Gas off. I'm going to finish it off with something light and fresh. Zest of lime. But I want the zest on top of the meatball. Sort of cut through that richness. And then finally, squeeze the fresh lime. And that just gives it that nice, zesty, amazing taste. Stir in the juice. Mmm. It's got that kick and that, that vibrant taste. Now, the exciting part. When you come to serve it, be generous with that coconut broth. Tilt the pan. Get a good couple of ladles of the broth in. Mmm. Meatballs. And that is a very delicious way of eating an old-fashioned meatball and bringing it into the 21st century. And they're just as good cooked from frozen as well. The secret to stress-free cooking is making it easy for yourself. Here are three more recipes, all based on my delicious, freezer-friendly meatballs. Just defrost them before you get started. First up, beef meatballs with arrocchetti, kale and pine nuts. Add meatballs to hot oil and brown. Meanwhile, cook arrocchetti pasta, then add chopped garlic to the meatballs and shredded kale, a delicious green veg packed with vitamins which cooks in minutes. Cabbage is a great alternative if you can't get kale. Put in some of the cooking water from the pasta to steam through. When the pasta is cooked al dente, drain and add to the meatballs. Season, then finish with sweet buttery pine nuts and grated fresh parmesan cheese. Meatballs with arrocchetti, kale and pine nuts from meatballs to meal in minutes. My next easy standby supper is beef meatball sandwich with melting mozzarella and tomato salsa. Top a lightly toasted roll with pan-fried meatballs. Then tear off chunks of creamy buffalo mozzarella, pile it on and melt it under the grill. For the tangy salsa, slice sweet red onion, then add juicy diced tomatoes and roughly chopped fresh coriander. Season and drizzle with olive oil. Spoon over. Perfect in a flash. Beef meatball sandwich with melting mozzarella and a tomato salsa, a sandwich to die for. My final super easy meatball recipe it's fiery meatball soup. Fry chopped onion and finely sliced garlic in hot olive oil. Add cumin seeds for warmth and add your meatballs. Cook on a high heat to get all those aromatic flavors out. Once the meatballs are browned, add hot chili paste for a spicy kick. Tin tomatoes dried oregano and a litre of beef stock. Then simmer. Next, add sweet corn and chopped courgettes. To finish, add hot jalapeno peppers, chopped fresh coriander and crushed tortilla chips. 
a one-pot meatball wonder that really packs a punch. Fiery meatball soup. One versatile meatball recipe, four deliciously different dishes, food that's certain to make your life in the kitchen easier and stress-free. Amazing. Whether you're making great food to freeze or to take straight to the table, you need to know how to shop for the best ingredients. Next up, my shopping guide to oils. It doesn't matter if you're baking, frying or dressing salads. Using the right oil can dramatically alter the taste and texture. Here are the most common oils and what to use them for. Sunflower oil is a good value all-rounder. Nice and light for frying, baking, in dressings and spicy dishes. Groundnut or peanut oil is great for cooking on high heat as it gets really hot without burning. Sesame oil, a flavoursome, sweet and nutty oil. Perfect sprinkled over Asian dishes before serving. Rapeseed oil is a healthier choice for using in salads. I love walnut oil. Fantastically fragrant, it's brilliant for salad dressings and it gives cakes a distinctive flavour. But the oil I use most in my cooking is olive oil. To find some of the best olive oils sold in Britain, you have to go to one of the most unlikely places. An electrical shop in London's East End. Turkish-born Mehmet Morat has olive oil in his blood. My family's produced this olive oil for centuries. What he doesn't know about it isn't worth knowing. The very best extra virgin olive oil is first cold pressed. It's actually pressed by stone and then it's put through a centrifugal spinner which spins out all the bitter waters and then you've got just pure olive oil, cold pressed olive oil and you've got to taste it to believe it. Pour a little sample, slurp it, draw it in with air, don't swallow it, warm it in your mouth, coat the whole of the inside of your mouth with it and then swallow. It'll go down like fruit juice and it'll leave no greasiness or oiliness in your mouth whatsoever. Absolutely sensational. Beautiful. My favourite use of any olive oils is to pour it into a, a bowl, room temperature, rub some wild oregano into it and get some fresh crusty bread and just dip it. It's food on its own. Don't need anything else. Welcome back to my ultimate cookery course. Next, on my guide to making it easy. I'll be creating a sweet treat to drool over. I want the chocolate like little matchsticks dotted around. But first, my quick guide to the basic kit you need to get cooking fantastic food. You don't need to spend a fortune on masses of kitchen equipment. Here are three more kitchen essentials. Whisk, spoon and spatula. These three items are so cheap, yet they are so important to great home cooking. A whisk, there's so much more control when you've got something whisking in your hand. You can gauge it so much better than you can if it's on an electric mixer. The bigger the balloon on your hand whisk, the faster it will whip as it draws in more air. Wooden spoons don't scratch pans and should be washed by hand. Spatulas are indispensable for baking or mixing. Make sure it's heat resistant so it doesn't melt. But more importantly, phenomenal for making omelets, great with scrambled eggs, and you waste nothing because the spatula almost cleans the bowl instantly. With these three, you'll be well on your way to cooking like a pro. And you'll need all three for my next recipe. My take on classic chocolate brownies is guaranteed to put a smile on anyone's face, and not just when they're fresh out of the oven. Blondies. Stock up on these delicious blondies. They'll keep for up to a week, and it's a great way of getting ahead if you're expecting guests round. First off, melt the butter for the mixture. We've had hundreds and hundreds of brownies. The sort of white chocolate version, i.e. blondies, are amazing. A little bit more subtle. Keep a little knob of butter for the end, just to grease your baking tray. Turn the gas down and gently melt that butter. Cast the sugar into the bowl. Just give that butter a little whisk. It sort of makes the mixture a little bit lighter, slightly fluffy. Off with the gas. A pinch of salt in the sugar. 
then make a little well in the middle and sort of whisk. You can see it's already gone nice and blonde. Love it. Give that a really good mix. And the secret with the butter being slightly warm, sort of, it melts the sugar. They're nice and smooth. Lovely. A teaspoon of vanilla extract in. Next, lightly whisk in two whole eggs. Just give them a little beat. This is such a delicious recipe, yet so simple. Whisk in the eggs. Looking for that nice, sort of rich, textured, smooth paste. You can see why we call these blondes. Beautiful. Next, a teaspoon of baking powder. Baking powder in. Then half a teaspoon of baking soda. That aerates the mixture and gives it that little tartness. You'll see this sort of rise instantly the minute they hit the oven. And then your flour. Whisk with one hand and just slowly add half the flour first. Get that all mixed up. Make sure that mixture is really nice and smooth. Check it occasionally. No lumps. Half the flour in, and then the other half in. You'll feel it sort of almost go nice and firm. And that's why it's so important to add the flour in stages. It stops the mixture going lumpy. It should be just dropping off the whisk. Beautiful. Change over from a whisk to a spoon. Next, I want some texture, some nice sweet chewiness to the blondies. Dried cranberries. They bake beautifully, but it gives the blondie a really nice sort of chewy sweetness in the center. Next, my white chocolate. I'm not going to grate it. I'm going to chop it up. Just slice it like little bits of shrapnel. I want the chocolate like little matchsticks dotted around. Now, chocolate in. Lovely. Fold that in. I want a nice, even distribution of those wonderful dried cranberries. Don't over-mix it. I don't want to break up that chocolate. A nice, even mix of cranberries and chocolate. You can see the chocolate. There'll be parts of the chocolate in the oven that will actually melt. It'll be like little pools of white melted chocolate in the centre. Now, baking tray. Small little knob of butter. I'm going to grease the baking tray and line it. Some greaseproof paper. And just overextend it. Shiny side out, dull side hits the bottom of the tray. In. Greaseproof allows me to maximise on the white chocolate inside the mix. No greaseproof paper, the chocolate can melt and almost stick to the tray, so the paper is just a really nice insurance policy. Secondly, we want that rise and that sort of crispness. Now, with the mix, get your spatula, go all the way round. I don't want to see anything left in that bowl. Position the bowl over your tray, nice and carefully. Lovely. Don't leave that slice in the bowl. Nobody's licking that one. And then just take the back of the spatula, go into the corners, push, and come back into the middle. Turn the tray around. Let it work to your advantage. Try and get it evenly positioned in the tray. If it goes in even, it cooks evenly. Make sure you smooth out the top of the blondie with the back of the spatula. And then into the oven. It's going to rise, it's going to get nice and crisp. All that soft gooiness in the centre. Bake your blondies at 180 degrees for 35 to 40 minutes. That smells incredible. Look at that crisp edge on the outside and that sort of soft, gooey centre. Leave that to cool down and it's going to sort of firm up and wrinkle, but it'll stay nice and gooey in the centre. Once it's cooled down, take it out and start slicing. Mouth-watering blondies, a fantastic easy treat to have on hand for yourself or to share. Next, my tricks of the trade and kitchen tips. To make your life easier, make sure you make the most of your freezer. My tip for amazing tuna carpaccio is to freeze it first. 
and it will slice beautifully. It's wise to save leftover wine for cooking. My tip is to freeze the remaining wine in freezer bags or ice cube trays. It's great in stocks and sauces. When you freeze soups or stews in tubs, the tip is not to overfill them. Leave room to expand in the container. A great tip for a cheese homemade ice cream, buy a high quality vanilla ice cream and make it your own by mixing in berries, chocolate, or my favorite, rum and boozy raisins. A fantastic tip for leftover lemons and limes is to cut them into wedges, freeze, and use them like ice cubes. They won't water down your drink, and they'll also add flavor. Follow my ultimate cookery course, crammed with key lessons. Top tips and 100 recipes to stake your life on, and you'll literally be cooking yourself into a better chef. Many of these amazing recipes are on my app. Please check out the App Store for details. Go on, get cooking.